This is Kevin Green. I'm Director of Security Solutions at Parasoft. Today, I have two esteemed colleagues with me, Brian Finster and Tracy Bannon. We're going to talk about DevSecOps, but more in more particular, we're going to talk about being a, a DevOps advocate, a developer advocate, I should say. And we all feel like developers need love, too, uh, given the, the, the amount of challenge that we have of trying to develop software at speed. I think it's important that collaboration is part of the ecosystem as well as good communication. So we want to talk about that and discuss some ways in which organizations, your organization, can have better advocacy for your developers and kind of streamline your DevSecOps processes. So I'm going to do a brief introduction. My name is Kevin Green, as I mentioned. I want to introduce Brian introduce himself and Tracy introduce themselves. So I'm Brian Fenster. I'm a, a distinguished engineer with Defense Unicorns, working as a value stream uh, architect for Platform One for the Air Force. And I'm uh, Trace Bannon. I'm a senior principal with MITRE. Uh, I've been working with them for a few years now. Uh, and my focus is as a, as a software architect and engineer, uh, helping them to define value, but to deliver um, across that entire stream and improve uh, all of their architectures and engineering. So let's get this conversation started. And I'm going to put the question out there. What does it mean to be a, a developer advocate? What does it mean to be a developer advocate? I start with you first, Tracy. Oh gosh. So let's just break it down into advocate, right? And speaking on behalf of, speaking for, helping, right? Those who are not given the opportunity or given the resources that they're needing, right? That's what we're more advocating whether it's a developer or somebody else. So let's apply it to the developers here, advocating for these, for our peeps, right? These are the, these are the folks who are the ones who are getting the, the pressure, deliver faster. By the way, make it secure while you're at it, but we need this now. We need it ASAP, just, just go and do it and go ahead and do it. And I'm feeling the stress when I'm walking into those rooms, when I'm hopping into those meetings, I'm just feeling it drip from the pores because they're not getting all of the love that they need. They're not getting this necessarily the support um, and the training. They're just being asked and they're very competent and capable folks who are, they're gonna wither under the pressure. And so advocacy, ah, it's let's let's help them. <laughs> let's open, expose this and let's do some better things for them. Brian, do you agree with that? I, I do. I mean, I've, I've spent over two decades delivering high availability systems to something that had to have uptime 24 hours a day for enterprise. And uh, I've, I've uh, slept under my desk. I've had, you know, pagers who would, uh, I'd have to have pagers going off all night and work all day. Mm -hmm. And to me, developer advocacy is how do I make that not possible, not the, the case for today's developers? Yeah. How do we... Uh, allow them to have better lives uh, and meet the goals that they're trying to meet and be secure uh, and be compliant and not be awake all night long. Yeah, I think one of the things I always think about is how can you seamlessly integrate things into the development workflow, right? To make things easier, uh, to take a lot of stress off a developer, um, communicate better, Right. And also provide context about what you're communicating about. Uh, and also really with security, I'm a security guy. Everyone knows I'm a security guy. I think there is a lack of training and awareness and there is an expectation that developers, although they are very smart and bright, very creative and innovative, um, security doesn't, is not necessarily a second, second language for them. It's something that a lot of developers struggle with. And I think part of it is I think sometimes when you have things pushed upon you, shoved down your throat, to, for lack of a better term or like better word, there is friction and that friction begins to crop up in all DevOps environments. So I think part of it is, is really trying to understand the pains, the, the workload, but also being able to communicate what you need from a developer and how you want it done. And I think that's part of understanding, showing the developers love and trying to get things moving in the right direction. Well, take I, a bit. Oh, go ahead, Brian. I was going to say also being able to communicate to senior leadership what the actual job yep. is. One of the problems I've had in my entire career is um, I'm, I, I was never taught how to code securely. I was never taught how to test. All of these things were things that we've talked about this before. I became a quality hobbyist and a security hobbyist. 
And the expectation is, is that we just absorb this somehow instead of having dedicated training on this. Uh, I don't think people really understand how little about development's actually taught in college or actually taught in boot camps. You get the basics of how to code. And that's basically it, how to do some design, but really not how to do enterprise development and secure development. And so advocating up to say, hey, we need help. If you want these outcomes, you can't just expect them to just appear. But that's part of that advocacy, right, is exactly what we're, we're calling out. What are the expectations? Realistically, what are the expectations? Then what do the additional tools, training and time mentoring, shadowing, there needs to be the this, this succession planning because folks move through their careers. You're not going to be an entry-level dev forever. You're not going to be a mid-level dev forever. You're going to iterate through your career. So what are all those expectations? Being able to net those out so that people can meet, meet the need, help the developers. What we're going to see is a revolving door. I mean, when we are in some of our projects, we're seeing that right now. If they are getting the support that they need for a specific tranche of work, they might not be getting it for the long term. They might not be helped uh, where their career wants to go. There's an interesting term that I heard used recently. Um, I used to work with Deloitte Consulting. They've got some really innovative ideas around managing people and helping them with their careers. But they've created a new C-suite role. Honest to goodness, it's called the Chief purpose officer. I thought that this was brilliant, Um, but it is about helping people, not just about training, not just about any one item, but getting the whole person and treating the whole person. I kind of saw that as an advocacy. And when I started to talk with you guys about developer advocacy, that kind of got into my head. How do we help to realize each one of those developers to realize their purpose? And how do we enable the organization to help them to achieve that purpose. Now, I know that sounds kind of lofty and wonky, but to Brian's point, if we're asking folks to do stuff and we're not setting an expectation or we're implying they should do it and they're being held accountable for scampering and getting some learning on their own and we're asking them, what are you reading in your spare time? But we're not giving them what they need to do. I mean, how many interviews have you conducted or been a part of where they say, so how do you keep current? (laughs) <laughs> like, well, in my spare time, I do all of these things. Imagine if we could say to them, and as mm-hmm. part of my day job, this is part of what my organization does to help me continue to amplify my delivery. Imagine that. That would be that'd be crazy. It'd be wonderful, but it'd be crazy. And I also think mentoring is a, is a part of it, right? And being able to mentor developers, right? Yeah. A next generation of developers, right? I, uh, I, I used to fund research in the federal government, and I had a... Pro- computer science professor say say to me, he said, you should not code unless you t- started with a software engineering course and understanding how to design so- a system. And then you can start coding. So I, I do think there is some, some learning that needs to be done at the academia level. And, and also, you know, obviously we have individuals who want to learn. There's, there's an eagerness to want to learn how to code, but understanding software engineering, system design, it's also important because that's where you get some of the base um, concepts about security, understanding how to build security in uh, so that when when you get into a work environment, these things are not foreign, but you have some idea. I want to shift the conversation a little bit, right, because th- I want to talk about a term, an overused term that it's constantly being driven. I hear in the market speed, 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 speed. I want to start with Brian. Why are people so fixated on speed as it relates to DevOps? Oh, well, I mean, come on. Our goal is to get to market faster, right? Uh, you know, I've, if, if you work in industry, you've, uh, time is money, and we want to go fast. If we have a feature that's not getting out there fast, then we're going to get beat to market by our competition. So speed is critical. I think the real problem is, is that um, the, there's the agile industrial complex is sold agile as a path to speed. And then people think that DevOps is a path to speed and we're going to focus on speed and you get speed if you do it the right way. Absolutely. Yeah, but speed is relative though. Speed uh-huh. is relative. The speed is relative. So, right. And but isn't, there, isn't it Brian uh, or who is it? Robert Yeoman who says um, speed of relevance. How do you market the speed of relevance for your organization? So unfortunately we hear the term, got to go fast. We got to have speed. And we look at 
an in, uh, industrial uh, organization, we look at commercial and we say, oh, wow, they're delivering to production 10 times a day, 50 times a day. Okay, let's let's throttle back a minute and let's take a look at government and what um, some of the different areas that we're talking about. Not everything has to be that quick. And some of these things really do have operationalizing. We're talking about software and software intensive systems. So right. when we're talking about software on hardware, it has some different needs against it. So speed is important, but speed within the context of what you're attempting to do, right? We got to get new capabilities out to the warfighters. We've got to get the new capabilities out to the constituencies. We got to do it quick. Guarantee that that's important. Define quick. How, you know, how, how, how fast is fast. And if you're right. moving at glacial speed right now, if it takes you five or eight years to get something fielded, which is what we're seeing in some areas right now. Quick might be <laughs> something in six months right. time. Well, well, well Tracy, Tracy hit on something that's one of my biggest pet peeves is using deploy frequency as a measure of speed. Yes. Because it is not. Right. Uh, this this is one of the most misunderstood of the you know, DORA metrics, which I'm currently working on a presentation on right mm -hmm. now, okay, is that Deploy frequency means speed. Deploy frequency does not mean speed. Deploy frequency is an indicator of batch size and quality process. That we no, have no, no, I thought it was just burn down. It's just burn down. All I need is your burn down. Give me your burn down. But, but if we focus on our quality process and we shrink our batch size, then we also get to deliver less to get the same amount of value, mm -hmm. which means we deliver the value faster. Right. But if we focus on this as a speed metric, it's not. I mean, to Tracy's point, if you're in government, you're not going to be delivering to an F-35 50 times a day. You should be able to go to a production like environment to validate this tiny batch didn't break anything. You should have an emulator for an F-35. Right. Right. But you're not going to deploy to an F-35 every single day. If the same with the same in enterprise, you're not going to go to a store's register 50 times a day. You should go to, but you should have tiny batches that you can validate, and that's not contextual. Right, yep. doing right is is very important. Right, building quality and security in from the onset onset is is part of what we consider as an industry in terms of doing it right. But I also think there's some cultural things that creates friction, creates a lot of chaos in DevOps environments, which which ultimately affects speed. If there's breakdown in communications, if it's not good collaboration. All those things in P process, which yep. ultimately the process is is how we deliver speed. So I do think that culturally, I think organizations have to be aware of the differences, the inertia that is is part of culture, and try to work to create a better culture. Then I think the processes that are are part of building software and deploying software will be more streamlined, so that you can get the speed right. You do it early and you do it often. I believe there you can accelerate a little bit to deliver to meet your deadlines and delivery. No, again, speed is the outcome, right? Absolutely. But to your to your point, the most effective way of finding those problems is to shrink the batch size yeah. and deliver smaller pieces more frequently. Yep. Right? Because then you find out that security, for example, is still using SDLC process where they're inspecting, expecting at the end. Or mm -hmm. compliance is coming in and doing quarterly audits uh, and then dinging you for the last quarter's worth of mistakes instead of being part of the flow. Right? Yep. 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 I mean, to your, to your point, if we think about DevOps and DevSecOps, and y'all know my opinion about the fact that we we keep throwing little phonemes in there and OpsSec, SecOps, SecDev. When we think about security, Brian, you, you often table pound about this. Quality and, and security is quality, right? If I'm turning out um, something that has a feature, but the feature is not secure, if the, if the cybersecurity is not baked in from the very beginning, we're not making just the, the basics of the quality. So we're not hitting what the need is. Getting things smaller is a really hyper important part of this. That's also a place where I found that the government is struggling. They very much struggle with smaller batch size because they've been so used to increasing the size of the contract 
increase the size of the acquisition, increase the size, because at scale must mean I need more people, I need a bigger army, I need a bigger group, I need a bigger battalion, I need a bigger, bigger, bigger. Naturally, let's scale it back, let's get it right. Uh, I love this phrase, and I've been saying this, I've actually been saying this with my own life lately. Um, fail fast, fail cheap, right? Fail small. Love it. That those things are important. And if we can help folks to realize that the smaller that that is, the, you know, a smaller cyber footprint, smaller batch size, all of those things are going to happen if we just make it a, a micro, not a microservice, just a micro version of what they were trying to do before. To, to your point, Tracy, that goes back to a talk I gave about the importance of software minimalism and only building software with the essential things that we need, right? Mm -hmm. Because more code means more problems, right? More, <laughs> more, code, more features means more code. More code means more problems, right? Um, and as you as you alluded to, it it exposed a larger part of attack surface, which gives an adversary more to go after, more to attack. So I do think that we have to figure out, you know, how do we shrink? How do we downsize? We don't need to supersize everything, but how mm -hmm. do we downsize things and batching that batch uh, process and things that you talk about create smaller batches? I think that's one way to kind of deliver, right? Could still deliver uh, value to the business, but do it in a much more streamlined process and streamlined way. Isn't you know, the what? phrase that every line of code is an opportunity for a for a flaw, right? Every line of code is an, another opportunity for a flaw. So you're right about the minimalism. Brian, I'm sorry I stepped on you. I just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about small batches. Small batches. Well, well, while you gather your thought, I want to I want to ask a question as it relates to developers. How how can developers still innovate without sacrificing security and quality? I think that's 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 like a that's like a balancing act. How, how do you how do we do that? So I, I just remembered my train of thought, and I can answer the question for me. Okay. okay. So the 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 you know the small batches. Um, no, I just lost my train of thought again. And the the way that developers can still <laughs> innovate uh, while remaining secure is by having security baked into the the pipeline. Uh, the this is the the key thing. We're in a world where continuous delivery is not a thing that you can go, maybe I need CD one day. If you want to be effective at development today, you need to be doing continuous delivery. You need to be baking security and compliance into the pipeline. I have um, a application building right now that if I make one small security mistake, my pipeline breaks it, and I have to go fix it. Now, I would like to have that moved left. I think we're going to talk about that. I'd like to find on my desktop that I made that problem and not in the pipeline. Right. But at least I didn't find out in production or find out in a year when somebody attacks us. Well, you do bring up a, a really good point. And this is a place where I push back. And Brian, I push back on you a little bit about this when we talked about it before. I don't want to depend on the pipeline. I want it there as a safety net. But I want to know that what's going into it is as high quality as possible. So mm -hmm. I, I do want to educate the developers. Uh, one of the prior conversations that we had, I mentioned to you that years ago, I had the luxury of being introduced to uh, a, cyber, a cyber guy. And we sat down and we talked about how we wanted to educate developers. So I've had a luxury about 18 years when I kick off a team that talking to them about secure coding practices, talking to them about how they could get access to scanning for this, talking to them about making it a part of their job on a day in and day out basis has been something that I that I personally do, but I'm it takes right, it takes a village, it takes a big community, it takes a lot of us uh, to impact many, many projects and, and programs that way. So how do we, what's the right way to bring that advocacy, you know, bring this back around to advocacy. What do we need to be advocating on behalf of the developers that will give them the cyber knowledge that they need or the cyber tools that they need before they check in code, before they depend upon a pipeline? Let's track it back to how do we start when you're onboarding somebody or what is what are those things that I give them that make their lives more likely to, uh, to so be? Go ahead. So I think that a an important exercise that that we fundamentally neglect and don't do as part of as part of uh, sprint reviews, user stories is threat modeling. And I think threat modeling is a an excellent opportunity 
to get developers to be aware of what could go wrong, right? The security threats, um, how certain new functionality, new features, what type of attacks we need to be aware of. So when we go to do, go do development, we're aware of that and we're defensive in terms of how we develop code to protect against certain types of design issues that we need to be aware of. So the question becomes, how can we leverage threat modeling as a way to train and bring better awareness to developers about the potential consequences of their coding and refactoring activity in creating or exposing, I should say, exposing potential vulnerabilities in software. I think threat modeling is an underutilized yeah. concept. You have, an, you have an impediment to clear in most environments, though, in most in most organizations, which is we, the, the attitude of security as investigating the crime of new development. Yep. Instead of security as a service to help uh, you, uh, customer value, right. right? That everybody, if, if everybody everybody is not organizing on how do we most effectively deliver customer value, then we're wrong. And that the organization has to change to be organized around how do we most effectively, most efficiently deliver customer value without putting the business out of, uh, out of business by being too expensive getting it done. Right. Uh, and this goes for government as well. I mean, there's more money to just throw around, but we still have to get uh, stuff to the end users and government efficiently and effectively, and those have to be the people we're focusing on uh, so that my job in security should be, okay, how do I help developers do this instead of how do I stop developers from being bad people? Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I heard a couple of different things. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead, Brian. I was just going to say, but what you're saying about threat modeling is entirely correct. It's the same as having people with, that have the mindset of how to test and how to break things from a functional point of view in the process of refining work before we start coding say what could go wrong with this let's make sure we design tests for that mm -hmm. two two points real quick the entire product team needs to be thinking about ways in which the new feature functionality can be misused and abused right i agree if yep. we get the entire product team on the same page i think i think we're we're reducing some of the friction that we, we see exist in a lot of DevOps and environments between developers and security, right? How do, you, how do we reduce that? And I think part of that is, is trying to introduce those concepts, those, because it, it's, it's collaborative, you're collaborating. You're really yeah. trying to focus on and create one way in terms of how to think about the problem set and how do we, as a, as a team, go about addressing it so we can continue continually uh, deliver value to mm -hmm. the business. So let me let me push on that that term collaborate. What's the what's Indigo Montoya say in the Princess Bride? It's like I do not think that <laughs> word that you mean is what you say it is. I probably got that wrong, and all of the all of the other um, Princess Bride geeks will will correct me on that. Yeah, I'm cringing inside. Yeah, sorry. The and it wasn't Indigo Montoya, right? It was the other guy who said it. At any rate, so <laughs> where I'm going with that is when we say collaborate, uh, we we bat that around so often, we throw it out there. What you need to do is you need to collaborate. True. Well, unfortunately, the the raw truth, the straight talk is that putting people together in a room, virtual or physically, and saying, okay, collaborate, it doesn't do squat. It right. means that you have individuals in proximity to each other with no tie to each other, with no shared objectives with one another. So collaborate doesn't work. So I, 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 I want to Frame that out there that you're telling me go oh. collaborate, pusha. I say pusha. No, so let's talk. You said oh. the key thing though. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say so, so taking it back though, you need to have a shared vision. So True. if we want to, you have a shared objective or a shared vision. So part of developer advocacy. So I want to tie this back to the advocacy. If I want to make the life better for a developer, and I know that quality involves security, whether it's threat modeling or something else, I need to track it back to giving them exposure, giving them understanding, giving them training, and I need to do the same thing for the cyber pro who has been taught that they were the safety net, not that they were part of the earliest parts of design. So both sides need to have that education. Right. And then let's set the objective together that we need this to be highest quality quality includes security and 
here's how we together are going to do it. We're going to do it in these feature reviews up front, definitions of done up front. We're going to do this modeling up front, and then we're going to add these capabilities within the platform that supports them into the pipeline that pushes things along after they've written it. That's where we're going to get the real help. That's how we're going to truly make a difference because the rest of it is just, just collaborate and just shift left. Our, our speak won't do it. Do, do you think a having a security champion embedded in a development organization is is one route to do so, some of those things and kind of bring the awareness up uh, and be an advocate for the developer and bring the awareness up regarding security for developers? Do you think a security champion works? I, I, I think, I, I think scaling security horizontally has to happen just like yeah. well. It can't be, you can't have a person who's responsible for security. You have to have some, you have to have people who are working to clone themselves and bring down on everybody else about this aspect of quality, just like every other aspect of quality. Yeah. Right? I tend to agree. I don't know if a single person can do it. However, a change agent can make a lot of difference. There, there's, there are numbers out there, and I, I should go and look them up. There's a couple of reports that talk about the ability of an organization to change if there's not some new blood, if there are not some new individuals that are there, because muscle memory is pretty strong. So embedding one person probably isn't going to be it. But to Brian's point, that horizontal influx of that thinking both both ways. I need the developers to be working in the latter parts of the of the the, the cyber um, assessments. I need them to be available, but I need security. I need cyber to be with me on day one, helping me to get there. So, well, so, go yeah. ahead, Brian. Well, I was going to add one other thing. I mean, you can't change things just by adding people. But what you can do is change the environment mm -hmm. because here's the reality is that, is that any team is working the way they are because they're successful in the environment they're in. And if you want different outcomes, you have to change the environment that they're in so that they will want to change. Well, isn't that what they say about a bad habit? You can't, <laughs> you can't just get rid of a bad habit. Right. What you have to do is replace a bad habit Something with, a, with, a, with a good habit that helps to achieve right some of the some of the same bells and whistles that the bad habit was but so, you have to have feedback loops built in so it's not just toil of remembering to do the good habit yeah because we have muscle memory here right we have muscle memory and, and you know we, you know how we do when we have when we have free time we we usually revert back to things we, we are comfortable with. Um, as a developer, Brian, I, I, I want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. No disrespect, Tracy. A one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. <laughs> Did I stop developing? Holy Not, crap. I'm yeah, kidding. crap. No, I'm no, this for both of you. This for both. Um, one of the things I want to know is, as we start to, to, to help organizations and we talk about being a developer advocate, right, how can we get developers to care more about security. I think that's what a lot of organizations have challenges with, right? How can we get developers to care more about security? Well, first you got to get them to care about the product. Honestly, I mean, it's the same with any other aspect of quality. First, they have to care about the product and they have to care about the users using their product. They have to care deeply about those things. We have to be obsessed with the customer. Mm. If they are, then they're going to want the customer to have a valuable tool. Right, right. And it's not valuable if it's insecure. And then you have to, and, and that's step number one, but step number two is just explaining to them how scary the world is. Yeah. Because they may not know. Why should I care about something I don't even know is a problem? All right. But if you show me that it's a problem and I care about my customers, I will absolutely do everything I can to fix it. Tracy? I, I do think it is a matter of making sure that there's an exposure because I don't think folks know how scary the world really is. I really don't think that our devs on a day in and day out. As a matter of fact, I don't think the majority of our delivery teams, anybody on those delivery teams realizes the threat that's there. Yeah, we hear about different breaches and we hear about pieces and parts, but let's give them, let's, let's either mentor them or give them an opportunity. Let's let them play with a wasp and burp and let them, let's let them, let's walk them through breaking in. Let's help them to do some ethical hacking so that they realize, holy moly, what I just created has this flaw. Help them help expose that in a way that's fun and relevant, 
they're going to start to step up then because they're going to realize to Brian's point, they really want what they're doing. Nobody wants to deliver bad stuff. At the end of the day, everybody wants to be proud of what they're doing. I believe the majority of folks. So helping them to have an understanding, right? Scare them a little bit in a good way. So you brought up a very interesting point. I've always said, like, how do we codify cyber defense into DevOps, right? And um, one of the things I was thinking about is uh, you mentioned breaches, right? I think there's so much goodness in breaches that we don't extrapolate. We don't use, we don't dissect. So I, I do think that if, if let's say certain relevant breaches that we see that we know is attributed to poorly developed software or software was an attack vector that was used and compromised, whatever the case may be. I think it's important to dissect that, right? Uh, because it's important to bring that awareness into a developer's mindset. Mm -hmm. So they understand like, look, here's the realism of what could go wrong. Here's the realism. This is not like some things in the ether that we just, we just thinking about that may or may not happen. No, this is something that actually happened, right? And let's dissect that. Let's have a tabletop exercise so that everyone is aware about all the things that went wrong. And everyone plays a role, role play. We can role play, we can talk about it, we can dissect it. But I do think that is a an important part of just understanding how do we build better software? How do we build things that that is somewhat resistance against resistant against adversarial behavior and tactics, right? I think it's important to do that. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's like a retrospective of sorts, right? Uh, but we need to be able to retrospect together whether it's a breach that we caused or whether it's one that we want to share out as a team. I'm all in when it comes to dissecting things together, right. but in a in a in a forum that is not adversarial, right? right? If if it if it's we're dissecting something that we did, we're doing a root cause analysis, or we're doing that that kind of modeling posthumously after an incident. We have to make sure that people feel right that sense of psychological safety that they are going to be able to investigate this together and fail fast, fail cheap. <laughs> and if we're going to talk about cyber, let's hope that it's a fail small, right? Or right. we we found it before the bad guy found it, right? But I, I like your I like the the approach that you're taking. Let's let's get it out. Let's have the conversation. Here's the hard part. How do you how do you work that into contracts? How do you work that into when we're saying oh, we need a, this many developer hours to do these tasks based on this request, this task order, this work order? Gets really dicey. It gets much more difficult, I think. Right. And, we, and we know a lot of a lot of integrators. They no no shots at no shot at the integrators. We know they don't do a lot of training with their <laughs> with their teams. So. Oh, you'd be surprised. Depends yeah. on the group. Not not their job, but you know the job is to make money. But uh, I mean, the reality is is that you can't do product development with project teams, and that's that's just straight up. You're not going to be able to do product development with project teams. And if you're going to treat developers as commodities, right, then you're going to get you're going to get the results of that, which is terrible results because product teams care about product, and project teams care about ending the project. And it's true. But the mindset hasn't shifted yet. And even with some of the acquisition conversations about how contracting goes, the government is still buying projects. The government is not yet. Uh, in some, in some, there are some unicorns, no pun intended. There are some places where we're seeing that, um, that shift project to product or to platform, project to platform. We're going to be a continuous organization. Those are the places where I am starting to see that investment in that same group because that posse is staying together. There's some occasionally somebody new comes in, somebody rolls off, but in general, you have that core together for a while. And I think that that starts to achieve where you're going, Kevin. We're not going to be able to do it on a, on a plain old a plain old project team because they're in there to code, load, hit the road. Right? That's what you do, and that's not what a a, a product team would do. I like that code load hit the road. Hit the road. Yep. I'm, I'm not saying where I learned that. <laughs> well, hey, hey guys, this conversation has been very, very good. And I think we probably could go on for hours, but I want to kind of bring it to bring it to an end and kind of, you know, ask you uh, one last question and, and let's have a conversation around it. What does the next generation of developers look like in relation to how we do developer advocacy? 
Well, that depends a lot on what the upstream is for inserting them into the flow, right? Uh, you know, how do we get colleges and boot camps to teach developers about the reality of enterprise development? Uh, and that you, you can't just pick up testing as a hobby. Um, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's the, the flow has looked the same for me my entire career, which is we get new developers and then we have to train them how to be developers. And I want it to be better for them and us. Uh, I, I don't know how to make it better other than to, uh, I don't know, make universities more agile. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I could I could go down a rabbit hole on the uh, what do we do with the universities? What do we do with the colleges? What do we do with the boot camps? Uh, gosh, you're right that once we once somebody makes their way into the workforce, we do need to kind of recalibrate their skills. That needs to change. Um, some of the big tech companies are working with schools. They're going the whole way down into the high schools and into the middle schools. And I think they're starting to teach that different type of thinking, Brian, where you're going. So I think it's not going to happen in the next four or five years, but I do think that we have the ability to impact uh, that 10 year horizon by getting involved earlier and then being able to influence forward into the colleges. Now, gosh, that's, that's 10 or 15 years though. So what do we do right now? Well, we're back to advocating for the peeps that are coming in to be a part of the product or programs that we are driving, that we're a part of. We have an imperative on us. Kevin Green, and you're over on my left, and Brian Finster, you're on my right. We have an imperative that we start to make sure that we're, if we already are advocating, but we need to do that. We need to make sure all the people in our, our tribes are becoming developer advocates as well. Right, I think if we build the right culture within these different environments and different organizations, I, th I think you'll see more developer advocacy and you'll see developers care. But I also think that as as software become more ubiquitous, right, and we see more and more attacks, I think some of these things will start hitting home to people and people become more aware mm -hmm. of security issues, right? And people will take a more, hey, I, you know, I don't want this to happen to my my company or the value that we bring to a company in developing this. And I think that could be something that can help, you know, jumpstart the the inquisitive mind of developers to want to learn more how to implement these practices. And obviously, these things need to be embedded into their daily activities, which some mature organizations have found a way to do it. I think by and large, people still struggle in trying to figure it out. But I do think that the possible future for uh, the next generation of developers, uh, it could be somebody who can be do both, right? <laughs> Understand both, but obviously more to the developer side, but not be totally unaware of security issues and risks that may occur in software. And, I'm, and we're starting to see more and more legislation, more people trying to take you know more care about and more interest in it so possibly we can see that in the next future so so any parting shots um you know the only other thing i had on that point was that coding is the least interesting and the most fun part of being a software developer um and uh, I think that's really important for uh, anybody who's leading software development who doesn't, who's not a developer to understand that is that there's a lot more to it than typing. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, if, if they want really good outcomes, they need to invest in their people. Tracy? I have to agree that development is very creative. Someone said to me one day, oh, it's your left brain, it's your right brain. I'm like, no, 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 you have no idea. It's like artwork, right? It is It is creative. Yes, there's science to it, but it's creative. And when somebody sits down and they're in their zone and they're doing this, um, influencing them means that you kind of have to wait for that first break and, and look for the right avenue to have the conversation because there is a delight that developers take. And I, mean, I know Brian knows this. I know this from my career that you take in sitting down and just pounding out some code and testing it out and making something work, bringing something to life. So, yeah, there's a lot of goodness. Let's bring it to life. And I always say you do with security, you do it early, you do it often so you can deploy and deliver confidently. Hey, I yep. appreciate Thanks for the time. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be some more things we're partnering on and work together on. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I appreciate your time. You betcha. Ciao. Thanks, guys.